Nani, and today we're talking about Kelly Link's The Specialist's Hat. Now, Link wrote The Specialist's Hat in 1998. It was initially published in Event Horizon. In 1999, she won the World Fantasy Award for her work. Link is an American writer. She focuses primarily, or has focused primarily, on short stories, although she does have a novel in the works. She has won three Nebula Awards, one Hugo Award. Link also, she lives in Northampton, Massachusetts, where she manages and edits for Small Beer um, Press, with her, along with her husband. Link's style is considered magical realism, fabulism, st um, slipstream, call it what you will. But what she does is she combines elements of different genres. So you'll see horror in her work, sci-fi, fantasy, you'll see folklore, you'll see fairy tales, you'll see romance, and um, she combines those elements to create her own fabulous work. Um, so Link's philosophy is that she likes the play between what is and is not real. She has said, and before I get into um, talking it further about Link, please note that any literary analysis done here is mine, but any sort of bi biographical information or historical information, I get that from other sources. For this episode, um, I have an article from NPR, one from Jezebel, one from Master Review, and all of that is I'll share that in my show notes. So please go ahead and read the full articles because I can only convey so much within the time I have for a video. Okay, so Link likes the play between the real and the unreal. She has said, you know, in her stories, something happens, someone does something, then, it hap then it's done and you're like, hmm, is that real, was it not? She likes when it's a little bit of both. And she said that, you know, in order for the unreal to exist, you need a real element. Not so for just the purely real realistic to exist, but for the unreal to exist, you need a real element to it. And you see that in her stories. Link is very aware of genre in her work. Um, she doesn't happen by accident that she has the elements that she does. She says when she starts to write a story, she thinks about the genre, she thinks about the conventions of the genre, genres that she's working with. Um, let's see. Link has said that you have to be careful when you're interpreting work or when you're writing work, when she's writing work, that she doesn't anchor a fantastic element too strongly to a singular meaning, symbolic meaning. Because she said when that happens, you lose the psychological realism and you flatten out the characters and you kind of take away from the reader's experience. So what's interesting about reading her is I feel like she gives the reader license to take some liberties with interpretation. First of all, given that we're not sure what's real, what's not, and that she's not, you know, she said she doesn't want you to come away like you've used a decoder when you say this means this, this means that, for sure. So her work is really most fun to read. Let's move on to, oh, I don't want to forget. She also talked about that she uses a nighttime logic, and I thought that this was really cool. She describes that as, you know when you dream and you wake up and you're just kind of like, that was weird, that couldn't happen. She said nighttime logic is different in that you wake up and you say, you know, I don't really understand what happened but I know that there's some sort of emotional truth to it. So bear that in mind, that nighttime logic that she uses when she's crafting her stories. So now let's get into the story itself. If you haven't read it, please do. I've shared the link below where you can find this story online. As a matter of fact, it's on Kelly Link's website. So read it at least five times and then come back. Okay, so the plot, and I'm gonna need my notes because there's a lot packed in to a relatively short story. What the story is about are two twin girls, they're about, they're 10 years old and a few days, maybe a few months, named Samantha and Claire, 
and they lost their mother 282 days prior when the story starts and they have moved with their father who is a writer to eight chimneys for the summer what eight chimneys is is it is the historical home and museum of what i glean was a relatively obscure poet slash writer um, from the turn of the century named charles Cheatham rash as you read the story we find out the father the father's writing a, um, a history of eight chimneys and we find out that the house is haunted and the caretaker and also the tour guide for the house because the house is a museum and so on the lower floors people are coming in to learn about brash i suppose and there's a gift shop and so anyway the um, tour guide says to Samantha and Claire, the house is haunted, stay out of the attic, and when you're in the woods, make sure you stay on the paths because they're snakes and they're an ugly lot, both of them, snakes and ghosts. So there's that. Let's see. The um, dad starts to become unhinged in the house. He is obsessive about Rash. He makes the girls listen him to him recite Rash's poetry during dinner. And he's taken to walking in the woods. He's drinking heavily. He's taken to walking in the woods during the day where he's apparently met a woman in the woods. And at one point in the story, he tells the girls that he is going on a picnic at night in the woods with this woman. And Mr. Kolsak, the uh, tour guide slash groundskeeper, housekeeper, I guess, won't stay in the house at night. He's like, I'll get you a babysitter. Then he disappears. But somehow, the night of their dad's date, a babysitter shows up. Just you don't hear the door open. There's no knock on the front door. She goes up the stairs to the dad's library. And she goes off with Samantha and Claire to play the dead game, which we'll get into what the dead game is a bit later but um anyway we find out that the babysitter used to live in the house she tells the girls and she Claire the sassier of the twins says well prove it and the ba babysitter says well go into the fireplace in the bedroom and reach up with your hand and there'll be a key so little Samantha goes and grabs the key and the babysitter says, yeah, that's to the attic, let's go. We could go up the chimney to get to the attic, or we can go up the stairs. So they go up the stairs to the attic, where the babysitter tells the girls that um, her father used to lock her in there. Her father was a writer, not a very good magician, um, and that he made a hat, and the hat is hanging on one of the chimneys in the attic, Claire takes it down. She says the cat, no, she says the hat belongs to the specialist. And when her father made this hat, the specialist took him and the babysitter had to hide in the attic so the specialist couldn't find her. Claire looks at the hat and she realizes there's 52 teeth on the hat and supposedly from the specialist will assume victims. She puts the hat on, chases her sister around, um, Weirdly enough, the sister's giggling and laughing, so is the babysitter. The babysitter grabs the hat off of Claire, the hat bites her, the hat rolls away. Girls and babysitter go downstairs, can't find the hat. Babysitter goes to get them to go to bed, and they play the dead game some more. And basically, the babysitter says, when you're dead, now, dead is always spelt with a capital D, not a lowercase d, and we'll talk about that. When you're dead, you don't have to be afraid. No one remembers your name. And you don't have to remember anything. Let me show you. Or here, I'll show you. Now, at that point, we don't know what happens to the girls. Are they, did the babysitter do something to them? Did she kill them? What has happened to the girls? Next thing you know, the father has returned home and the babysitter ushers the twins up to the attic because it's not, she's telling them it's not really the father. It's the specialist because the specialist can sound like anyone he wants. Father's coming upstairs to her and saying, I'm worried girls, where are you? I've been bit by a snake. 
the end. The girls are up in the attic. Okay, so let's talk about how Link has structured the story because that's a huge disservice when I run through the plot like that, but you know, you've read it. It is extremely weird and eerie and disturbing in a lot of ways. The way Link structures the story is as she's telling the story, she inserts verses from what we assume are Rash's poems. And when you read, when you go back, you realize that those poems, and it's really about some disturbing, creepy stuff, are kind of foreshadowing what's going to happen in the story. But aside from the poems insert, inserted into the story, there's a moment where there's an oral history of eight chimneys that's in there. And the reader is left to assume that this was not written by, and I'll tell you why, Rash, but it's about Rash. And it is about how he became jealous of his wife, maybe she was having an affair, and he killed her by pouring snake blood into her whiskey and then snakes got in between what he called the skin and the meat of the body and you can see them slithering up and down the wife and she became hollow inside and then eventually she died. And after that oral history, it says, my daddy saw it and that's it. So again, we're gonna assume that that was not from Rash, but either it was inserted by the, his daughter, the babysitter, or the girls, who knows? But let's talk about the dead game next. So we know these are two little girls whose mother has died. And eight days after the mother passes away, they start to play this dead game. Dead, when they talk about the mother's death, it's a lowercase d. Dead game, capital D. Um, you have to wait for 35 seconds, I believe, hold your breath. And the mom passed away at 35 and some days or months. And then there's three rules. One, numbers are important. The girls are writing a tragical history of numbers. Two, adults can't see you play the dead game. And three, when you play the dead game, you do not have to be afraid. So bear that in mind when we start to really analyze what happened in the story. Where did the girls go? what's going on and what does it mean to be dead with a capital D. Now as for genre, this is clearly a gothic horror style story. We have a family moving into an old house that Samantha the twin describes as dustier and darker than a castle. We have the classic, it's a family in a new place. So they're just moving into this house. Um, let's see what else. We have the world's haunted, obviously. And it's interesting because years later in an interview, I think it was a 2015 interview, when Link was talking about being a stranger in a strange place and living in Northampton, Massachusetts. Now that's a real college town. There's Smith College. Mount Holyoke, I believe, isn't too far from, from there. It's a gorgeous place because of the foliage in the fall. And she said, you know, it's full of tourists and it feels a little weird when everyone goes away and everyone's just passing through and you're there permanently. And you see that strangeness with these girls living in this museum where people are passing through and they're stuck there. So I thought that was interesting. Link's writing is, the sentences are simple, they're not complicated, and it's amazing what she conveys through the just word choice and simple sen sentence structure that she uses. She creates this atmosphere that is, um, and I bring up the, the simplicity of the language just because it's quite different when you think of a gothic novel and you think of, say, the Brontes or even a Du Maurier. But Link describes this house as being pressed by large oak trees on the outside. And the house has a hundred windows made with
like blown glass. So it creates this kind of wavy light in the house itself. And she describes it as green and dim because of these trees pressing on it. You know, each floor, because of the eight chimneys, has eight fireplaces, and these are old school fireplaces, the tall ones that you can walk into. She describes the fireplaces in the girls' rooms, Claire and Samantha's room, as, well, when they go in, they can hear the wind rushes up behind it, and it smells, when you smell the flu, it smells like water over rocks, it smells musty, their bed smells like mothballs. You get this green, swampy, dark, dusty place, and you smell dampness. And anybody knows when you smell dampness in an old house, that's never good. It's never good. You think of mold and rot. So the whole story, the whole setting has this real kind of classic gothic -y, feel to it. The girls' beds smell like mothballs. Um, now, the story is definitely a monster story. It's Link we're talking about. So the specialist, we don't know what he is, but it could really be a real monster, malevolent being. We have what we will assume is a ghost in the character of the babysitter, who is likely the dead daughter of Rash. And then we have folklore, fairy tales, whatever you want to call it. The dad just goes off into the woods, you know? Who goes off into the woods and meets people? Random woman in the woods. Um, and we have, again, oh, I didn't mention. When the girls had gone into the woods, Samantha thought she saw a woman, but Claire thought she saw a, a snake. So you have this snake creature. So you have that fairy tales, you have a gothic horror ghost story. And so let's now talk about the, where should we go? How about links? Yeah, let's talk about the numbers in the dead game. Because when you pay attention to the numbers in the story, I really think that is where you're going to find your meaning. And I want to make sure I just don't but before, well, obviously the number that you see the most is eight. The house is called Eight Chimneys. The girls start playing the dead game eight days after the mother dies. And Samantha says that her favorite number is the number eight, because when eight is upright, it looks like a woman bent over with curvy hair, she describes it. But when you turn eight over, it looks like a snake with the tail in its mouth. Now, eight can mean infinity when you're looking into numerology. When you look at the biblical references of the number eight, eight means rebirth and new life. The resurrection was on the eighth day. So we're going to refer back to eight or think about Samantha's interpretation of eight when we think about the difference between death with a capital D and death with a lower case D. Because Samantha actually says, yeah, when I think of the number eight, the difference in the way you can view it, it's kind of like when I think about death with a capital D and death with a lower case D. So Samantha is the sensitive Samantha is the one that has the eyes that are described. Her sister has gray eyes, the color of cat's fur. But Samantha's eyes are gray, like the color of the ocean when it's raining. She is the sister that seems to be drowning a little bit, a little bit, a lot, in sorrow. She mentions that she, she can, she's starting to forget what her mom looked like. She remembers what her mom smells like. And she, um, there was something else that she had said about her mom that was terribly sad. Oh, she once wished that, you know, she could have horses or a horse and she'd rather a horse than even her twin sister. And now she's feeling guilty because she says, I don't have a horse.
but I don't have a mother either. So I think she's bearing a lot of irrational guilt the way a child will over a loss of a parent. So it seems that Samantha wants to, is having a hard time dealing with the real world that she's existing in. And the reader is left to wonder this death, this game she plays where she goes to be not afraid. Is that removing her from a reality that is just too difficult and dark to deal with? Because it's not the death as in the lowercase death of her mother. Also, when we think about eight as being the number of rebirth and resurrection, when the girls go up into the attic, they're surprised at how bright it is up there, given how dark the lower floors are. They also, it's mentioned that the chimneys, the eight chimneys, impale the roof of the attic and it feels like they're, they're breathing, escaping the house. And so you get a sense of a little more, oddly enough, in an attic where people go and hide from the specialist, there's another reality up there. There's another different life up there. And at the end of the story, that is where we see the twins flee to with the babysitter to hide, is in the, is in the attic. And a final thought on that number eight. The story itself, we have two stories running parallel. We have the story of Samantha and Claire and their dad, and their dead mom, and we don't know what the cause was. And then we have the story of Rash, the poet, who likely killed his wife and his daughter, who he was locking in the attic and needed to escape from the specialist. And you wonder if it's just the dark side of eight. And somewhere in numerology it talks about, you know, that is the dark side of eight, that it's, it's greed and just wanting too much. And when we think about the greed of, um, and jealousy of Rash when he, if he did kill his wife for being with another person, you, it's kind of like that darkness is brought into the world of Samantha and Claire and their father. So, you know, you're left after you read this story. You can read it just once, you really can. And you're just like, what was that? And it's disturbing and you get that bad stuff is happening, but you really do have to go back and reread it. But it doesn't matter how many times you do because at least for me, I'm still left with so many questions at the end that I want to leave you with. Okay, so what do you think? What happened to the girls, Samantha and Claire, at the end of this story? What does it mean to be dead with a capital D? Who the heck is the specialist? Remember, it's Kelly Link. She deals with vampires and zombies and those sorts of creatures. And then, what happened? When we think about, if you're viewing this, from the lens of a horror story. It reminds you of The Shining. You know, you have this dad. Was he, did he become possessed by this malevolent force, by this spirit of this obscure poet rash um, who is, what's going on in the woods? Is it the wife of rash? Is it the wife, the husband and the daughter, their presence? that's still in the house that is disrupting this new family? I don't know. Anything else I had to ask you? So, you know what? Think on it. Let me know what you think. Ultimately, is it just a story of, not just, it's never just a story, but is it a story about a grieving child where being in the reality of, you know, being in a world without her mother is too painful, and yet she has to be somewhere, so she wills herself into this dead space. At the end of the story, she does say, you know, she's contemplating being dead with a capital D, 
and she's talking about, you know, now I'm here with my sister, the babysitter forever. 10 was a difficult year, and 11, I wonder if 11 would be like needles. And she says, um, you know, what if dead is? Maybe I'm done, when I'm done here, I'll decide something along the lines of to be dead like my mother. So it's a tragic story. It's a scary story. It's a fascinating story. And one more thing that Link does, it's not, when you're reading it, it's not that it's heavy though. I mean, you do enjoy reading it. And Link does some interesting things like right before the dad goes off into the woods with his date, you feel like they're in a different time and place. The whole family. There's nothing really modern about the story. The girls aren't watching television. They're, you know, they're not playing video games. They're in this old house. And then suddenly the dad gives, he gives each of the girl, each of the girls a kiss on the cheek and he's like, okay, I'll take you if you're good with the babysitter. I'll take you to that Disney movie this weekend. And so Link's got you here. And then she's like, no, don't stay there. We're really over here. So it kind of sets you off balance a little bit. And then you have these weird elements where the babysitter, who we're thinking is a ghost, right? When she yanks the hat, uh, the specialist hat off of Claire, the hat bites her and she bleeds. But then the babysitter, who should be from the early 1900s, her response is, shit, which that's weird too, because I don't think that would be the natural response of a kid from that age. It would make sense if Samantha or Claire said it, but not a girl from almost 100 years earlier. So what do you think? Please tell me. Um, leave your comments below. You can also um, reach me on Twitter at Heather underscore Nani.